it's important today that we honor our students and the families who have supported these students at this very special place at this time. This is more than just a commencement. It's the beginning of something quite large. It's the manifestation, the beginning manifestation, of a divine presence that willed this institution, manifested this institution into what it is today. I first want to thank the students for having the courage and the inner direction to come here. I work in the world of, of the big universities. And my current university has 25,000 students. Within five years, we'll have 35,000 students. The university I work for in Chongqing, China, has close to 300,000 students. The University of Regensburg, when you include all the branch campuses, has over 30,000 students. All of those institutions are wonderful. All of those institutions have students that I love dearly and I honor them when they come to my class. I learn as much from them as they learn from me, I am sure. But those institutions are also what I call third chakra institutions. They're all about creating and doing. And that's important in this world. We like our computers and our iPhones, our blockbuster movies. I'm still waiting to see the new Star Trek. <laughs> but a new dispensation is needed in higher education that can take the richness and the doingness of the third chakra way of inventing, doing constantly, arguing, all those things that make third chakra what it is. It's a creative impulse, a creative energy. But a new dispensation is needed, and I think to the students I want to say thank you for recognizing that this is a place that will meet you where you are. A call for an inner something, something to grow, a tug, an urge. And so on this commencement day, congratulations on your degrees and your certificates. But I think honor is due you for the fact that you chose this institution to more fully bring into life your inner life, because that's really what wisdom is all about. I want to thank the leadership of this institution, the faculty and the staff, and all the supporters of this institution that has made today possible. Yes, there's a divine dispensation to make this happen, but then there's the work that has to happen to manifest the happening. So what a wonderful day, and what, 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 how thrilling it is for me, because of my history with Ananda, to see this day come to fruition. I can't uh, speak here without also acknowledging the passing of Swami Kriyananda, who um, had a vision and a dedication and fidelity to his guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, that I so admired and loved. He knew and would not be surprised, I'm talking about Kriyananda, of the magnitude of this day in terms of what it portends. In fact, he wrote over 40 years ago a short little book called The Road Ahead. The first time I read it, it just almost scared me to death because it was talking about, oh my gosh, the systems as we now know it are all going to be. But then as I read it towards the end, it was really a call to faith. It was, what he was really saying is it's okay. The changes that are going to happen are okay if we're coming from a place and this is why I want to go back to our students, because I think our students here are coming from that place and just needed a place that would nurture them. 
to be centered enough to deal with the challenges that are ahead. I think his second book, which I also had some small part in, Crisis in Modern Thought, really is the sequel in that he detailed the limitations of what I call pseudoscience, which is what many universities have built upon, and a philosophy that's based on the individual completely devoid of spirit or consciousness, heart, and openly denies the divine presence that is embedded in each and every one of us. So that's how I want to start my talk with the students. And by the way, my talk is for the students, although I hope everybody else is, is, is with me. Uh, Swami never promised anybody I know an easy life or club med existence kind of thing. He always talked about rigor, devotion, how to be a disciple, how to be creative. And he um, was always interested in young people. And an interesting thing happened to me two years ago when I was in Berlin with my students. I pick up my students in Munich, but we travel all over the country to the University of Regensburg. And we do, I show them superconscious art, is what I call it. Art that actually says to them, once we get into it and we unpack it, that, oh my gosh, this is real. You can feel it. You can see it. And we do things like we unpack the, the, uh, the Last Supper. And we were doing this in Berlin one day where the students actually act out the parts of the Last Supper. And we, when we get right to the moment when we have done this, I say, do you feel this? And what happens every time, and I've done this with group after group, international students, this is a cross culture. When you get to a sacred space and replicate that sacred space, something magical happens. And so I ask the students, I say, are you feeling what I'm feeling? And this is what they all say every year. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I just wait. Silence comes in. The space is more amplified. And I say in a smaller voice, do you still feel it? And they generally say, uh-huh. They just, and then they go into silence. And we hold this space for a minute. And then when that's over, Every group can't talk for two minutes. Now, I just want to, to share with the audience now how rare it is for college students, and high school students, university students not to talk for two minutes. It's, in fact, it's rare that you have anything less than 10 second intervals, but it's total silence. So we left the building, it was an art institute, and went out to the streets of Berlin, which was an alternative universe after we did that experience. And when I'm working with them, I insist that they have to live off of 15 euros a day. And we're eating out. That's in Europe. You can easily spend 20 euros for breakfast. And it's, 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 it's a way to work with students um, to, to force a discipline. So this is what we were doing. So we're out trying to find a restaurant. What this means, of course, that we usually are vegan. Uh, we're doing uh, alternative restaurants, which is where all the interesting people are anyway. And what we often do, we get to a restaurant and we pool our money. So if I have 20 students and I say, can we all put in five euros? All of a sudden we're talking serious money. Then we negotiate with the restaurant and see what they'll do for 20 students. It's amazing. And it always works. So we were in this restaurant doing that. And I looked over to my right and there was this really dark skinned gentleman who uh, just was radiant. And I noticed on his t-shirt he had Yogananda and he had yoga on top. And so my students were negotiating. I, I don't negotiate with the students. I just say, you do this, and then I'll join you after you do this. And then you tell me how it goes, and we'll evaluate how we did on the negotiation. Actually, it's a, a secret. Once you enter in negotiations with the Germans, and if you come with that, with an open heart, you can get almost anything. And that's what the students, the Italians are harder to work with. They say, I'm sorry, it's just, it seems counterintuitive, but it's true. I have research to back this up. So anyway, they were doing great. And so I went over to talk to this, to this, uh, this gentleman who's my age. And I said, uh, I just introduced myself. I said, I'm drawn to your, your shirt. And he said, oh yeah. He said, I'm a yoga teacher. I teach here in Germany. I have a yoga class that goes in France. I also teach in Italy when I'm not in India. And I said, well, what's the Yogananda piece? He said, oh, my teacher my teacher's guru 
was a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And I said, oh, really? As I kind of sat down in the chair. And I said, I'm really interested. And I said, I am too. I said to him, and we just kind of exchanged eye contact for about a minute. We didn't say anything. And then I said, do you remember anything that was said to your guru's guru directly from Sri Yukteswar about education? And he just kind of went into a really sweet silence and took me with him. And we just waited. The restaurant sounds were going all around us. And finally, he opened his eyes. He said, yeah, there's one thing. And he said, I hadn't thought about this in the longest time. And he said, Sri Yukteswar said to his guru's guru, who was there when uh, Yogananda came back from America, in the 1930s, children should be in a place and an environment that teaches striving for the light. The holders of that space must reside in the light. So I got my napkin out and wrote it down. Children should be in a place and in an environment that teaches striving for the light. The holders of that space must reside in the light. And I just said, thank you so much. And he said, yeah, it's amazing. He said, that's, that's, that's something that my guru tried to live out of by holding a space for the teaching. So students who would feel safe enough to listen deep enough to go to places that might be threatening to them and have an open heart. So that's something I wanted to, to share with this group because I haven't shared it with anybody. I've been using it myself in my own teaching about holding a space and, and putting material out for my students to join that is conscious, even super conscious, that can help all of us strive more to the light. But I also knew the responsibility that I had as a professor to be in that light, to reside in that light. And I think it says everything about, uh, for you students going forward as adults, about residing more and more in the light and holding that space so you can have that open heart. A friend of mine story, an Oregon story. A friend of mine recently, and this was very recently, was telling me about an experience he had in Ashland, down in Southern Oregon, at the Saturday Market, which is a really amazing affair of people. It's a confluence of all kinds of ages and cultures. And he took with him a visiting Buddhist monk. He went with his orange robe, shaved head, his prayer beads and just was just there taking in the whole thing. And the two of them were there and they had this Saturday market unfold. Anybody from Ashland, you know what I'm talking about. We have all these stalls and you have people selling things, you know, everything from dried fruit to perfume to soaps, the whole kinds of everything. And people were happy, people were relaxed and everybody was just totally wonderful. And all of a sudden out to the left came this voice Said, hey, mister, you need to help me move. And my friend kind of looked over, and this lady comes right up in front of this Buddhist monk and says, mister, I need to move and you need to help me. A more of a declarative statement than a question. Not, would you help me move? You need to help me move. And my friend was shocked out of the stupor of being in this space with his Buddhist friend. And was waiting. All of a sudden, he thought, he said, I need to wait and see what happens here. This is going to be interesting. And the Buddhist monk looks right at her, stares, just stares deeply into her eyes. He said, Yes, I'll help you move. Sure, we're going to help you move. So, my friend and the Buddhist monk spent the last, the next day and a half helping this person move out of her apartment in Ashland to another apartment right outside of Ashland. And so my friend was doing all this and looking at him, the, 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 at the monkey, said, what's this all about? <laughs> and the monk said, just another opportunity to practice compassion. I love this story. Not just because it's a Southern Oregon story. <laughs> because it says so much about a radical position to be in the world that we live in. The world that I've been mentioning of big universities, uh, big data, 
all these things that we that we also need in the world, but it's quite it's not enough. A recent Gallup poll questioned Americans of what we valued most as a culture, and the results were three things: achievement, affluence, and appearance. Again, <laughs> achievement, affluence, and appearance. And this monk modeled something radically different from that. There's nothing wrong about achievement. There's nothing wrong about affluence with a few asterisks out there. You know, what, what do we mean by that? Or even appearance, if we're talking about healthy kinds of things. And I can make an argument. But isn't it interesting that that's what a culture, that that's what we prize the most? It's totally third chakra. It's just coming out of, out of, of getting and doing. And, 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 and being recognized. It's not about being more collegial or about harmonizing. It's about standing out, being distinctive as an individual. I was thinking, is there an animal in the universe that really models third chakra thinking? Or, um, and I thought it was the tiger beetle. I really thought about this. The tiger beetle is this small little beetle about this far, about this big, and it's the fastest moving creature on Earth for its size. And it will move from point A to point B. You almost have to take a picture with a fast film to see it. And they say, BAM! It's gone and it's there. But there's an interesting thing about the title view. When it's moving, it's completely blind. Because it's always moving when it's moving, and that's all it's doing is moving. It's, it's doing. See, I think this university, and I think the students who were drawn to this university, don't want to be blind when they're moving. They don't want to be blind when they're sitting either. And that brings me into what a fourth chakra institution might look like for people who work in that realm, what they do and how they are. The animal I chose for that is a bird. It's the robin. The robin, if you notice, hops, 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 listens, stops, checks it out. Gets a reading. Hops, 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 stops. Checks it out. Gets a reading. That's my fourth chakra bird. I'm, I'm really crazy about this bird. <laughs> and Western culture, and this is one of the things back to Swami's crisis in modern thought. Uh, Western culture loves the idea of what I call, what the, the ancient Greeks called techni education. Technique education is always formalized. It's always about plans, strategic plans. It's about blueprints. It's about design. It's about getting those outcomes. Metis, M-E-T-I-S to the ancient Greeks, was more about experience. The Greeks said that only through wisdom, by the way, the Greeks had a place for technique, but it never led the consciousness, consciousness of the culture. It was Learning by trial and error, successes and failures. Learning through what I call networks of practice. That's Amita's way to approach, and that's more in the fourth chakra. Steve Jobs is known as a genius, and I want to talk about my meaning of a genius compared to a more modern interpretation of a genius. Steve Jobs was able to, in many, in many instances, work in both worlds, both third chakra and fourth chakra. Apple is a third chakra operation. It's, it's, you know, we just found out recently that they've been boarding billions of dollars in taxes. That's totally third chakra. And yet, when it comes to design and usability and sensitivity to beauty, it's a fourth chakra. And he was able to walk that. I have a story that hasn't been printed, and this was, comes out of an interview with his wife. That I found interesting because I spend every November in Venice, Italy, working with students on art. And I go to a place called the Ferrari, which is this one of the first Franciscan church in Venice. And in the Ferrari, there's this Bellini uh, Madonna that is amazing. And apparently, Jobs, after he found out he had cancer, wanted to do some discernment in one of the places he goes. He goes to Venice because he's also going to build a boat. And there, the boat makers are there. But while he's there, he was told that there's this amazing painting, and it's, it's the one place that I always take my students, that Bellini did, and he watches it. He goes into this chapel, and there it is. 
it looks three-dimensional. In fact, it doesn't even look like a painting. It looks like a sculpture, but it's a painting. And he sees it, and he looks at it, and then he sits in this one spot, and I'll have, have all my students sit where he did. Then he moves across in this small chapel to another spot, gets another perspective. Then he goes back and gets yet another perspective. And then he says, this is, this is talking to me. I'm getting something out of this. And it's one of the most powerful uh, religious paintings on the planet. He gets so, and, and it's two-dimensional. He called John Carpenter, who's one of his head guys at Pixar. He says, get on my jet, get over here. I've got something to show you. He comes and he sees it. And then out of that comes a little sequence in Up, which is my favorite Pixar movie, where the little boy, the Boy Scout, and the older man, it's when they're up in the air, and they're looking past the fireplace, and they're looking out the window, and looking down. That's the first 3D in an emotion. That came directly from that experience. I bring this up only to make a point of how we can move between the technic worlds and the mitos worlds that the ancient Greeks knew about. I've been, my students all encounter, of course, uh, the great Michelangelo. Michelangelo actually wrote sonnets. And one of his sonnets, he talks about how when he's creating, he puts, he lifts his hammer. I'm going to turn to the side because there's something I want to make a point. He lifts his hammer and he puts the chisel right here. <coughs> so there's physical, causal, and ethereal space. So he puts it into the ethereal space. That's the space where if you're going to get a download from somebody else, that's where you get it. And so that's where he put his chisel and his hammer. And so he said in the sonnet, every time he would lift his hammer for a blow, he'd, he'd hesitate and wait. And then when he got the message, he'd hit and pull it back. He did this tens of thousands of times. One of the great pleasures I have every year is I, get, I have a classroom right next in the academy in Florence, right next to the David. So I take my students out around the corner. I said, there it is. Let's look at it. I, I, I read them the sonnet. We play with it. We look at it. And so they can get the idea of what it is. That space. That's when the meetest reality comes in. And this is what I believe this university is all about. It's how we can be with the technique and move with the meetest. And I think this is what your students knew when they came here on an intuitive level. That there was something else you needed. There was something else that spoke to you. And what we have are these great masters across cultures who can tell us, if we would just listen, that this is a reality that's ours to access, it's ours to manifest, it's ours <coughs> to play with and to do with. And that's what I think you're about. And that's why I have such confidence in all of you. Because I think you understand this at some deep, deep level. And you are with the faculty that know how to reside in the light. One of my favorite little poems is The Woodcarver that Thomas Merton translated. And I want to use this as an example of moving in the Metis world. Ching, the master carver, made a bell stand of precious wood. When it was finished, all who saw it were astounded. They said it must be the work of spirits. The Prince of Lu said the map of the Master Carver, what is your secret? Ching replied, I am only a workman. I have no secret. There is only this. When I began to think about the work you commanded, I guarded my spirit. So that's a command from the Techni world. Did not extend it on trifles that were not to the point. I fasted in order to set my heart at rest. After three days fasting, I had forgotten gain and success. After five days, I had forgotten praise or criticism. And after seven days, I had forgotten my body and all of its limbs. By this time, all thought of your highness and the court had faded away. All that might distract me from the work has vanished. I was collected in the single thought of the bell stand. Then I went to the forest to see the trees in their own natural state. 
When the right tree appeared before my eyes, the bell stand also appeared in it, clearly, beyond doubt. All I had to do was to put it forth in my hand and breathe it in. And this is what Michelangelo, Francesca della Francesca, Piero, all these guys that amazing artists do to this day. They just had to begin. What happened? My own collected thought encountered the hidden potential in the wood. From this live encounter came the work which you ascribe as spirits. The challenge I have had personally is how to walk in both worlds between technique and mitis. And I've come up with a four-step process that I use with my students that I want to share with you. And I do this at the beginning of, before I take them anywhere to, 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 to see something that I think is spectacular. I said, okay, let's sit down and we're going to do the four steps. And the first thing is just to stop. The second thing to do is to listen. The third thing to do, and it's hugely important, is to ask for assistance. And the fourth thing is to move with your inspiration. So students, from my generation to yours, I hope that you remember what I just said, the importance of being like a robin, to stop, to listen. I think robins ask for help. I've asked for help all the time. The thing that's really wonderful is when we ask for help, and it's with a sincere heart, we will get the help we ask for. Saints and sages of all religions across all cultures make this promise to us. And one of the reasons I think you're here today is not just for us to honor you, but for you to take a charge. And the charge is to remember your gifts. The charge is to remember that you can stop. The charge is to remember that you can listen. The charge is to remember that you can ask for assistance. And the charge is you will unquestionably get that assistance. Carl Jung, who's had a big influence in my teaching, had a favorite story that went something like this. I call it the water of life. He said the water of life wishing to make itself known on the face of this earth, bubbled up in an artesian well and flowed without effort. People came to drink of the magic water and were nourished by it, since it was so clean and pure and invigorating. But humankind was not content to leave things to the Edenic state. Gradually, they began to fence the well, charge admission, claim ownership of the property around it, make elaborate laws as to who could come to the well, put locks on the gates. Soon the well was the property of the powerful and the elite. The water was angry and offended. It stopped flowing and began to bubble up in another place. The people who owned the property around the first well were so engrossed in their power systems and ownership that they did not notice that the water had vanished. They continued selling the non-existent water, and few people noticed that the true power was gone. But some dissatisfied people searched with great courage and found a new artesian well. Soon, that well was under the control of the property owners, and the same fate overtook it. The spring took itself to yet another place, and this has been going on throughout recorded history. To Jung, this was a very sad story, and, but he was particularly touched by it, since he saw how a basic truth can be misused and subverted into an egocentric plaything. So my charge to all of you is to see the living well and the waters in the well for what it is, and then to maintain it, to cooperate with it, to be with it. If we do that, we are in alignment with what the universe is asking of us. That's what I think you need to do. And I also want to close with a couple comments here, and I have something else that I want to do from an Iroquois nation. 
in a way, I think what we're talking about for our students is a new type of pilgrim. And I want to, to, to read you something. To journey without being changed is to be a nomad. To change without the journey is to be a chameleon. And to journey and to be transformed by the journey is to be a pilgrim. And so I would want our students, and I would hope for this university, not only to guard the precious waters of life, but also to always hold the promise of the pilgrim. <laughs>